Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very excited to have Thane Ringler on the line with us today. Thane, how are you? I'm doing well, John. Great to be with you here. Uh, so happy to have you, Thane. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the listeners? Yeah, so my name's Thane. Uh, I'm Kansas boy, born and raised. Uh, spent some time in LA and now in Denver, Colorado with my wife. Uh, and I work with people on human development performance, helping unlock their full potential. Uh, it's kind of the work of liberation, um, liberating people to their highest good. Uh, so I'm working, focusing on teams and organizations for that. Uh, and I also have a background in golf. I, I played golf my whole life, including some years professionally. Uh, and so there's a new wing of my business that involves leadership development with golf competition called the Leadership Majors. I've been putting a lot of hard work in. And I'm really excited about bringing that into the world. So um, I love all things uh, sports, uh, learning, coffee. Uh, <laughs> I'm a man of faith and um, I'm a big snowboarder as well, which is why I like the mountains here. Uh, and I'm trying to be a lifelong learner. So I'm excited to learn from you today, John, and share this conversation. Oh, I love that. There's so much to unpack there. First of all, uh, I play golf as well. Certainly not professionally <laughs> in the <laughs> least. It is my favorite thing to do, uh, mm. albeit to the tune of 100 plus shots on a fairly frequent <laughs> basis. <laughs> um, hey, that's great. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. You get out with your friends, have a couple beers, have a couple cigars. Mm -hmm. It's just like a nice way to spend three to four hours, depending upon <laughs> the the group in front of you. Totally. Yeah. Hopefully not five or six, but yes, the three to four hours is great. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so tell me a little bit about like that process of like, you know, you said from LA to Denver and a little bit about your business and, and kind of how you got into morphing from golf into leadership training into kind of helping people live better lives. Yeah, it's a windy road. You know, I think all of our journeys are more windy than we expect or, or anticipate. And, you know, a lot of my focus was obviously being the best that I could be. It was really, um, I left that. Um, and, and I had a background in entrepreneurship already with studying business in college and then also forming my own business around myself for professional golf. I raised funds through investors, had a, a business plan and um, went through that for about three and a half, four years. Uh, and through that process, um, I learned a lot about myself. It's kind of a deep dive into self-awareness. As you're aware with golf, right, you learn <laughs> so much about yourself on the course because you are kind of an island. You're kind of on your own in a sense, and you're left to your own uh, thoughts and um, understanding how your thoughts affect the outcome of the shot. Uh, which there's a direct correlation big time, you know, mm -hmm. and you see oh, that yeah. with immediate feedback every shot, right? If you're thinking, <laughs> okay, don't hit in the water. Well, the ball almost always ends up in the water, right? That's just how the, the game works. Yeah, um, at least for me. <laughs> so for all of us, you're human, right? We're all human. Uh, and so we all struggle with that. So it's a really sweet um, arena to, to learn a ton about yourself, how you're wired, how the mind affects outcomes um, and start working on developing mental discipline as well as um, optimizing your body and your mind for that performance. Uh, and from that, I really felt like I could offer something of value to people in the coaching space once I transitioned out. And so that's kind of what launched me on the path. I never planned it. Uh, I never um, had this great scheme or, you know, 10-year vision. Um, I just kind of was trying to be faithful to take the next step. And that's kind of led me to where I am today. That's pretty cool. Um, obviously, that's uh, I've found having conversations with people like where are people. Um, how have like some of your successes or failures as a professional golfer kind of morphed your ability to coach other people and kind of impact them on uh, you know on their whatever? If it doesn't necessarily have to be a golfer, but just in, in general. Yeah, totally. Well, the cool thing is, um, again, it's a human experience. So I think the the elements, the, the regardless of the arena, whether it's a sport, whether it's a performing art, whether it's an actual trade or a business, um, they all share the same principles or characteristics at their core. And like you said, there's successes and there's failures. And in golf, there's way more failures than successes, right? There's mm -hmm. one champion or one winner and 140 plus other losers, theoretically. Um, and so you have a lot of opportunities to learn from your failures. And really in life, we're going to 
learn the most from the things that we messed up the most. We we learn what not to do before we learn what to do. And and if we can get good at not um, accepting that as our identity, not saying I am a failure, but this was a failure, this didn't work out how I wanted, um, and reframe it as more of a learning opportunity and what can I take from this and how can I improve and grow from it. It's, a, it's just such a great skill to have in business and life uh, throughout our entire journey uh, because we're all going to face that at every stage, you know, and I, like for me now, I just, in the last couple of years, I got married and, and being in a relationship and a marriage is a whole different role than I ever had. And I'm learning that to a whole new degree now of like how I fail at times in my relationship and how I can grow and improve at that and, and what those learning opportunities are. And so, you know, that's going to happen, Lord willing, when we have kids one day and <laughs> um, in other roles down the road. And, and so it, it really repeats itself in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I, one of the things that I've touched upon a lot in this podcast is like the amount of growth that I've been able to achieve individually over the course of the last, say, one to two years, I don't think would have been possible had it not been for trials and tribulations and failures that I've had. And I think there's always been an inherent social negative connotation with failure. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your podcast is how you frequently touch upon and mention living with more intentionality in your life and kind of focusing on the things that are kind of bringing you up versus dwelling on failures. Um, but I, 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 I often say that I'm not sure if these are lessons that I could have learned 10 years ago, right? Did it take a 10 year, um, you know, plan of being brought up and being brought down for me to kind of feel the most comfortable that I've ever felt in my own skin. So I say to you, do you think some of the lessons that we kind of uncover over life's journey are things that can be imparted only with time? Or do you think these are things that we can inherently try to instill to a younger generation at a younger age? I would say both. Yes. (laughs) And right. Like I think both are possible to different degrees. So you know, one of the, my favorite quotes on experience, I think Whitney Wolf heard said, experience is the most expensive currency in the world. Hmm. And I think that's a really great word in that you can't, there's no value, mon- monetary value you can exchange for experience, right? So that that's very um, understood and goes without saying almost. And like you're pointing out, there are things we can learn from others who have gone ahead or on the path with us alongside us. Um, like through this podcast or other means or reading books that help inform us and hopefully help um, help us take less steps, I guess, to get mm-hmm. there, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not that we aren't going to be have to take all the steps to get there, but we can maybe take better steps or we can have um, more companions along the road so we feel more supported. You know, and I think there's a lot of, uh, in, in like human developmental psychology, there's a couple books I've read recently. One's called The Evolving Self by Robert Keegan. And another one that I'm in right now is called A Brief History of Everything uh, by Ken Wilber. Um, and th- the ideas that they communicate really share this core value that as we develop as humans and as we all grow and evolve and change throughout our lives, this process of development includes two core things. It's called transcending and including. And so we, or differentiation and then reintegration. So, you know, what we were at one point, we transcend or grow out of or become or develop or differentiate from, right? And this happened to get specific and personal. Like for me, when I grew up in Kansas, that was my perspective. That was my worldview. That was my um what, what I understood to be normal. Sure. And then when I left to Los Angeles and went to college out there right now, now my world is completely different, right? It's, it's expanded, it's broader, it's more diverse, it's more fluid and changing, and there's so much more that I'm experiencing. And, and so I have to transcend my past experience to start understanding this new normal and grow in that capacity so I can assimilate, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just one example of that. And then we also, we don't just transcend and deny or remove or remove or dismiss we include or reintegrate that past into our nor- new normal our new present and so that process in, in a kind of a complex but simplistic way of saying we use all that's um all that's happened in our lives and we include that in our journey and our story thus far that helps us continue to grow in the future and that process of transcending 
and including, I think we're in our entire lives. Um, hopefully, right? If we yeah. if we stop, if we if we kind of push pause on that and keep the circular motion, we often become entrenched, and we see a lot of that, you know. And we're all capable of that. It's not that anyone's immune from entrenchment, but it's a good challenge of like, how can I not be as entrenched, and how can I be more engaged with what's happening and seeing it with open eyes with curiosity trying to learn and understand as i am in the moment wow yeah i like that a lot um i i guess i never in you know uh articulated you know like the stuck points in my life or like the stuck points in my personal growth as like an entrenchment um i think that's an important kind of lens or or, uh, context for the feelings that you're in, in in that particular moment that again with the benefit of hindsight i can now see right down the yeah. uh, down the the path but not so much in the moment that's that's an interesting uh context for it um i'm a i'm a photographer and i've recently kind of fallen into this um profession by just happenstance right the last year and a half has been transformative for me uh individually from a career perspective from a you know relationship perspective from a multitude of, of arenas. Um, I still struggle with things like confidence, imposter syndrome that are not really detriments to my work because I'm obsessed with making art, but they certainly will affect, you know, my my long-term, you know, growth, right? These things mm-hmm. are inherently something inside me that makes me feel less than. Um, talk to me a little bit about any issues that you may have encountered in your past as a professional golfer, going to college, you know, leaving Kansas City to LA, um, where you've either felt like an imposter doing something like playing professional golf, or uh, really how you kind of tackle these issues of like confidence and imposter syndrome. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I want to touch on one quick thing that you just brought up before that question, and that's the idea of entrenchment. I think just one last final thought on that is that I think I think what's more helpful to think about for us personally than entrenchment is embeddedness, mm. um, because entrenchment all, almost always has a negative connotation, right? And and for good reason, right? Entrench- entrenchment entails almost like a prideful ignorance. It's like I'm proud that I'm so stuck in my ways. <laughs> yeah. And everyone else sees it. And you see, the reality is we're all the play experience, right? It's that bias that we all have that we we just have. It's a natural bias, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So that embeddedness um, helps us see, okay, maybe when you ask yourself, what am I embedded in? And that helps us understand the layers of it because there's so many layers of what we're embedded in, right? Like I am in a, a occupation and a world where there's a lot of um, emphasis on growth, right? And so I'm almost embedded in this growth mentality oh. that helps that that blinds me to the beauty of people that are existing with joy and simplicity, you know, and not always pushing to the next. So that embeddedness, I have to ask myself, what am I blind to, or what am I missing, or what am I um, embedded in that, that could be helpful? I like that. Um, so people aging instrument and really trying to understand or see them or learn from them. Um, and we can all do that and which is nice, you know, <laughs> Yeah, totally. I like that. Um, a lot. So back to imposter syndrome, uh, dude, you know, the, the great thing about this is again, I think this is a human reality, you know, and it's something that I don't think it goes away. You know, uh, when you hear from, um, people, of all types. Actually, I just read a story yesterday about J.R. Smith, right? This great NBA player just played his first college golf tournament, right? Yeah, and awesome. you think about it, he's like so nervous on the first tee and he can barely like get together that first round. The second round, he comes back and plays pretty good. But but that idea that, you know, this guy who's faced all the pressures at the top of the game at, at the best in the league in basketball, right? The feeling on the first in a whole different realm, it just shows you like, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how much experience you've had. It doesn't matter where you've been. We all still can face that in a variety of ways. Um, and so I think it's helpful to know that you're not alone. Oh, and it's yeah. helpful to know that, you know, um, this. I, I don't have to try and figure out how to remove this. I can try and figure out how to use this for good, right? And I think that shift really helps with like, okay, for me, especially in golf, right? Like, when I was competing as a professional, like those first t-, t jitters are real um, at all levels. And and for me, I got to think about, okay, I don't want to try to, For it took me a while, but when I finally got the place of saying, I don't want to try to remove this, how can I embrace this and use it to my advantage? 
then I started realizing that like that amped up adrenaline and the heart rate and all those things were actually an extra boost. I could hit the ball further. And if I could just, you know, if I could go into it with that understanding of where I was at inwardly, that heightened sense, then I could shift my focus a little bit. So with the higher adrenaline, a heart, um, a faster heartbeat, then I would really focus on being um, really good with my tempo and rhythm, being a little smoother, a little slower, because I was so jacked and amped that my tendency would be to be super quick with it and you know hook the ball or hit a bad shot. So by just understanding that, I could give myself the right cue and then use that impulse for good. Uh, and I think that application can apply in a wide variety of ways. Oh, I totally agree. And I, I think it's important to touch upon one of the things that you said where you were like, everyone kind of feels this imposter syndrome, no matter what it is they're doing. I've been lucky enough to have these kinds of conversations with famous photographers who shot Sports Illustrated covers and, uh, you know, content creators with millions of followers on, on various platforms and stuff. And it is completely common for everyone to feel that like whether you're walking into the studio for the first time or the 500th time whether you're shooting you know the most famous person on the planet or your parents it's like kind of a natural feeling and what you said is crucial to it is like how do i take this feeling of less than and turn that into a positive um and something that can sort of like kind of frame you into the right context for, okay, this is something that I'm, you know, really hyped about or really nervous about. And like, how do I kind of facilitate that feeling into a confidence that can like push me through to the shoot? Um, I think that's uh, really, really important. So yeah. What, and go ahead. well, even I'd love to hear from you on that. What have, what have you found helpful for yourself in facing that? Have you found any strategies or practices that um, you found to be empowering or liberating for yourself? Totally. Yeah. Um, one thing that I do quite frequently on shoots is, um, when I show up to the studio, obviously getting everything set up is, is part one. And then right before I'm about to take the very first shot of the shoot, I do a really, uh, short breathing technique, which is two short breaths in through my nose and one long, slow exhale through my mouth. And it just kind of focuses me and it, it's something that I do that just helps me release tension in a moment. And it's funny because I saw it on a TikTok or, or, or an Instagram reel or something. And I was like, that's so stupid. It's never going to work. <laughs> and it's insane because I can literally feel the pressure and the, and the tension from my shoulders drop as I do this five second breathing technique. And then I'm locked in. And as soon as you start making pictures within the first two minutes, you're, everything's gone, right? You're in the moment, you're focusing on what you're doing, you're trying to deliver to the client, to the model, to whatever it is that you're working on. Um, but yeah, that very, very short one minute technique has drastically improved my, my, whatever that initial struggle is with confidence or nerves or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I, I, I love that example because it really can't, doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be this crazy, you know, routine that takes 30 minutes before every experience, you know. I think, I think the key there, like you just pointed out, is that we need to figure out what's best for us, right? And that's going to be different for John as it is for Thane, as it is for whoever's listening, right? And that's one of the things that took me the longest to learn in golf was that I, I, I needed to stop looking for the blueprint for success, right? Mm. When I got into professional golf, I'm, I was in a whole new pool and a whole new world. And so I was looking to the guys that I admired or respected or the people that I thought were just a few steps ahead of me. And I was really focused on them and what they were doing and how I could copy what they're doing so I could be successful. And about after a year of doing this, I realized that was a completely wrong approach. I was trying to be someone I wasn't. I was trying to imitate others when really I needed to understand myself and how I'm wired and what I needed versus what they needed. Uh, because inherently there will be differences. And, and I love your example because, you know, it seemed like a stupid video that would never work, <laughs> but for you, it really clicked in and like, this is it, you know? And so once you're able to experience it, then you can start maintaining that to that tool. Um, and, and I think that just empowers us to, or liberates us to know that, Hey, just because it worked for John doesn't mean it'll work for you, um, but try it or try something else and find what it is best for you in that. Totally. So when you were kind of dealing with this, like you, you, you mentioned you tried to do something for a year, kind of copying your mentors, the people in front of you who are doing better. 
what was it that made you realize, hey, this is not working? Did you utilize the help of someone else or was this something that you internally figured out, you know, just on your own? Uh, both, for sure. So um, I had a great swing coach at the time, John Ray Leary out in L.A., great guy, um, really helpful. He, he taught me a lot. And um, he kept um, talking about, and, and also my college coach, Jason Simmelsberger, they, they both really emphasized, like, you need to find your go-to shots. You need to find um, what you can fall back on when you're not feeling. You need to find your kind of recipe for success in that sense. Um, but really, it never super clicked in right like I kept hearing that um, and I knew that would be good and true but I really didn't um, embrace it as my truth I guess or what was best for me um, and and when I was experiencing it I remember uh, what, what one of the um, kind of routines or habits I created around myself was after every round I would journal um, and, and write out like what I learned what was good what wasn't good how I can improve. Um, and that was such a great practice for my own growth. Uh, and, and what I realized was there was a guy I was playing on some of the mini tours with. Um, and I realized that when I played in his group uh, with him, I found myself playing a lot more fearfully because I wanted him to be impressed, right? Mm. And, and I wanted him to think that I was a good player at the core. And so I played out of fear of what he thought of me, which one distracted me. And two, when you play out of fear, you're always going to play worse and defensive and this, this won't be your best game. And so that really was an aha moment of like, wow, there's some deep core things here um, that are affecting how I'm competing and playing depending on the guy I'm playing with. And then that aha led to realizing I need to stop looking so much to others for their approval, but not only for their approval, but also for what they're doing. I need to really own who I am and how I'm wired and my game hmm. so that I can be my best and not try to be anyone else. Uh, and so that was kind of a big aha turning point for me. Yeah, I love that. Um, do you think the utilization of like good coaching mentors that you had in your life kind of opened your eyes to maybe this is something I could do myself? Totally. Yeah. You know, I think um, I was really blessed by having a lot of uh, people pour in my life from my parents um, growing up to um, realtors in college and then coaches along the way. Um, so, yeah, I think at every step I've been really uh, privileged to have uh, people speak in and over and alongside my life that have created the man I am today, you know, 100 percent without a doubt. And so, um yeah, I think I think a big heart in, in my work and in, in getting into this work now is just experiencing the fruit of that in my own life and being so grateful for that and blessed by it um, that I, I, I would love to do that my entire life for other people, you know, and so that's, mm -hmm. that's been the trajectory, I guess, like you said. Yeah, totally. I think that's one of the reasons why I do this podcast. I've reached a comfort level in my own kind of existence that I would love to say something or conversate with a person that positively impacts someone else. Um, I had a friend over this past weekend and we were kind of talking about um, life and, you know, what's going on in their life. And, you know, they were kind of really struggling with so many things, right? The, the, the world can feel so overbearing and so pressure mounting at times. And I was like, listen, I was like, there are practical things that you can do that can positively impact other areas of your life. If you're not making enough money, get another job. If you're unhappy in a relationship, maybe it's time to kind of rephrase or look at what that is in context of your relationships. And there's like, it can be at times such an overwhelming existence, right? We're constantly bombarded with feeling less than whether it's on social media, whether it's in any possible avenue, that it's like, we need to take that self time a lot more often. And a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think you're really touching on a, a really important piece of our current cultural moment. And I, I think at the core of it, like, like you're saying, when, how often do we or do we experience from others, someone speaking life into people, right? Do we give that or experience it from others? Like very rarely, you know, mm -hmm. very often it's um, speaking death into it, right? It's yeah. like, critique it's negative it's what's always wrong with the world it's what we disagree with it's what we're upset about or uh, frustrated with or how the other person's wrong 
Um, and none of that is life giving, uh, or for ourselves or for the person receiving it, you know, but totally, man, how amazing or different would the world be if we all improved at speaking life into one another, oh, you know, it, it's, it's simple, simple, but it's so mm-hmm. hard to do. Cause I think it's counter cultural and counter kind of worldly almost, you know, I think even that second law of thermodynamics of entropy is almost how the world tends to gravitate towards decay. Mm. And so if we're going to oppose that, if we're going to act in opposition to that decay, we have to have intention, kind of like you're saying, right? And we have to say, okay, how can I speak life into John today? Or how can I speak life into my neighbor when I see them today? Or fill in the blank. And and that doesn't happen by chance. It never will, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's so, so crucially important to so much about what impacts our daily lives, because we're just constantly bombarded with negativity, whether it's on the news, you know, positives. that's super, super yeah. important. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, when you look and at, you know, I, I think, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say one more thing. I think with, you know, the other thing is like, our world has so much noise in it. And so distracting that we need, we need some separation to create that intentionality. Um, And and just to encourage people like, uh, I don't think I'm any better than anyone else in this, right? Like, as, as we're talking, I'm like, you know what, man, how, how good am I speaking life into my wife? You know, like I live with her, I, I see her every day, but how quickly I slide into just not even thinking about speaking life into her, the most important person in the world, you know? So like, totally. like, I'm like, gosh, I want to get better about speaking life into my wife. So, so um, it takes space, it takes eliminating noise, and it really takes, you know, that reminder daily to do it. I like that you said that because it's it's an easy thing to kind of lose sight of. Um, and, it, you know, when you're just constantly bombarded with negativity on a daily basis, it's hard to just like not be like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right screw that guy like you know whatever like whatever the context might be and it's like versus trying to figure out what can be learned from the situation what can you know positively be changed and trust me i am not like this today because i was like this 10 years ago i'm like this today because of what's transpired over the last 24 months the 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 growth the 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 change the the immense amount of like self uh introspectiveness that i've kind of been able to give myself over the last year or two is why i'm trying to be more positive and less of an asshole like like in my (laughs) news (laughs) yeah totally (laughs) small town counting yourself and finding that you know yeah um from bill and uh, and i think that's like just i mean it fits me very well um i didn't you know get to choose where i was born in the place i was born in the time and the people the family all that. So I, I'm very privileged in that. Um, and I'm really grateful for growing up in Kansas. It, it's a very simple, grounded place um, that's really beautiful. The people are really um, just down to earth, grounded people, which I, I really appreciate. Um, and it's great growing up in a small town, like 45,000 people. Uh, so it, Hutchinson, Kansas is where it is. And you know, I think there's just a real beauty to that uh, that I'm I cherish and I love visiting and going back to and and I think flipping on the the he- on its head and going to LA where it's complete opposite was also <laughs> a, a really life giving experience because you know I, both are good in their own way. There isn't a right or wrong. Um, there's different preferences and different results, but both are needed. Um, and and getting to live those experiences was. Uh, really expanding for me. You know, I, I I think about who would I be if I hadn't left Hutchinson and if I was still in Hutchinson, Kansas. And I would be a very different person just by those simple choices of being in a different place. Um, and and so it's really fascinating to experience that. You know, one of the things early on in that transition for me uh, was experiencing kind of the disconnect from uh, who you were and who you are now, right? When you go away and then you come back, uh, periodically, uh, and the friends that you had or the people you knew um, still are very similar in their perspective or worldview, and yet you've changed a lot. And the assumption from their end is often that you're the same person mm-hmm. because it's an inward change. It's an inward experience, and it's not something that is outwardly visible. And it wasn't a part of their experience, and so uh, they don't recognize, or it's harder to see that in me or in others. And and so that was a really interesting experience to go through that disconnect or um, the gap between who I was and who I am now 
especially in other people's experience and eyes. Um, but over time, it gets um, to be more recognized and noticeable and nor uh, normal. Um, but, but I think those experiences really were um, helpful for me in figuring out my identity and then also being comfortable in that, you know, and being comfortable in who I am versus maybe who other people think I am or think I was or want me to be. Hmm. Uh, and I think those were kind of the training grounds for it. Nice. I, uh, I do want to touch upon the privilege aspect of things. I think that a lot of times what gets lost in kind of where we grow up and the luck that we have with, I'm blessed to have an amazing family, an amazing group of friends, and like there is inherent privilege in that, right? But like it's also not something that I take for granted. And I think when you're given the opportunity to like be blessed with something like that. Like I didn't choose my family. I didn't choose where I grew up that if you can take that and like put it as a little feather in your hat and be like, okay, this is something that I was like given a leg up on and never forget it. It can do great, great service to you later on in life because you always remember that you were not hitting a triple. <laughs> you were born on yeah. third base. And, yeah. I and I love that quote for that reason because the the especially in the time that we live in, it's lost on people that just because you're sitting 90 feet away from home plate doesn't mean you worked to get there. There are plenty of people mm -hmm. who had to hit singles and doubles and triples and run their ass all the way around the bases. And I, I, I love that quote so much for, for that, for, for sure. Um, I, uh, I think it's like super interesting when you come from like an athletic background to now like doing coaching for like individuals, co you know, uh, companies, groups, etc. Um, talk to me a little bit about whether you have like a preference, whether it's working one on one or like from a corporate perspective, and then tie into kind of like hey, when that, you know, either positively or negatively impacts your day when you're dealing with either like an easy client or maybe like a, a difficult one. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, my, I've had more experience with individuals and teams up to this point. Um, so I think I am the novelty or the excitement around working with teams and organizations makes me drawn to that more right now mm -hmm. because a little newer in my practice, I partnered with a giant this last year. And so that's when I started focusing on teams and organizations. Um, and really like, I, I really like working with people, um, kind of in that middle tier of society, the ones that have, a lot of the survival needs taken care of. Um, they're they're existing fine, but they're not doing much with it. They're not really understanding their their core identity. They're not really um, leading themselves as well as they could and impacting others as a result of that. And and most of those people, um, a don't want coaching. B don't think they need coaching. Or C don't have money to pay for coaching. Right. And so working with teams and organizations allows the company to re pay me to reach those people. And sure. so that's, that's what I, I've been more excited about. Um, but, but it's interesting, like you said, there is a wide range of, of experience, right? There's some clients that are um, more uh, inclined uh, and are naturally wired in a similar way, and we connect really well. Um, and they're excited and, and encouraged by the work. Other people, <laughs> uh, other clients can be... Um, a little bit rambunctious. They can be. Um, a, uh, they can be kind of a force of opposition. There can be a lot of disagreement, um, or there can be conflict in it, or negativity in it, right? And so, um, as a as a coach, the goal is to hold space for people and to be a mirror for people ultimately. And so, a lot of it is my preparation coming into being like, look, in this situation, in this environment, in this role. It's not a personal thing. It's not a relational thing because I'm very relationally wired uh, and I can be a people pleaser in that. Uh, I have to really shift into um, the role, the hat I'm wearing in that situation. Um, and that takes priming or preparing myself for it so that I can show up in a powerful way for them. They don't need me to be a friend. They don't need me to be a confidant. They don't need me to be a buddy right? They don't need me to be, even be their teammate. They need me to be a coach, someone that holds space and holds them to the standard that they want to be held to. Um, and that's a lot of the value in it. And so I really do, especially with the harder clients, have to um, kind of gird up my loins, you could say, or prepare <laughs> myself, right, for for being that person in that situation. And, and it doesn't, it, you know, every client's different. Um, but for me and how I'm wired, 
um, it definitely takes a little bit more uh, priming before those difficult clients. And after those difficult co- clients where you've, you know, in essence, been like a punching bag for them for an hour, 30 minutes, whatever the context is for the uh, the duration, how does that, like, how do you leave that kind of uh, state and then, like, on to the next kind of thing? Like, how do you, like, remove whatever that kind of, like, wash of negativity on yourself? How do you kind of, like, leave that behind? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I think that do them well, standing their results. They have to hold up taking ownership and leave is for ourselves and others. Um, taking ownership means you take responsibility, but there's things that we don't need to take ownership for. And that's <laughs> one of them, right? If yeah. I'm taking ownership for all of my clients' actions and their results and their success, I'm going to live a miserable existence, yeah, right? Because totally. I can't control anyone else other than myself. And sometimes it's hard to control yourself too, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a big reminder for me is like, I've done my part. I've taken ownership of what I've needed to, and I have to leave the rest to God and to what's going to happen and, and walk with open hands in that sense. Um, so that's, that's the big reminder for me in helping with those transitions. And then sometimes you're, you know, there will be some carryover effect that maybe, Maybe I need to clear the afternoon and not and not do harm or norm. It is kind of a the the of what you need in that moment too. Oh, I love that. I think the 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 part of of taking ownership with yourself and kind of not other people's actions and or whatever it is that they're doing is so crucially important. I wish I learned about taking ownership of like the things that I say, my actions, like everything in my life. 15 years ago, like in my early 20, I'm 35, you know, at 20, 21, 22, I wish I realized the impact that I could have if I just owned my actions and the things that I said. And again, I think it's something that you learn with time to be able to be able to, you know, look at the things that you're doing work wise and be and want to be proud of putting out a good product or a good sales report or whatever the hell it might be. But I, I, I am so grateful for learning formative how uh, to, to do um, more at being better of taking ownership of their own self. Yeah, no, that's huge. Um, I, I think it's, it's so crucial, like you're saying, and it is, it is a, I think just on the last thing we talked about, one of the one of the books I read this last year is called um, "The Courage to Be Disliked." Um, it's by a couple of Japanese authors. I don't remember their names off the top of my head, but so uh, you know, one one thing to note before I, the taking ownership question was there's a great uh, book I read this last year called um, "The Courage to Be Disliked." There's two Japanese authors. I forget their name. It's a beautiful narrative between a, a young philosopher and an old uh, wise man Um, and in it they have a chapter that really stuck with me called uh, the separation of tasks and it's this idea that um, we need to separate the tasks or ask ourselves whose task is it and this it goes back to the idea of taking ownership and what we need to take ownership for because there's a lot of things we take ownership for that we don't need to and so understanding that helps it helps us understand that by asking the question whose task is this, right? So if, for example, um, you know, my neighbor is upset about something and I start taking that on and being like, okay, well, I need to do something because they're upset about something. Well, that's not my task, right? right. Like I, I don't have control over them. And so, so that idea, that concept of like whose task is this is really empowering. Um, but but the reality is there's a lot of things we do need to take ownership for, including our thoughts, our actions, and our decisions um, that we make, right? We can't pass off blame because we'll never grow in that sense, um, and we'll never help others in that sense either. We have to start with ourselves. And the thing that I think really is at the core of taking ownership well is a level of self-awareness, right? We have to understand what it is that we need to take ownership for and what we're not taking ownership for in order to start taking better and more fuller ownership or responsibility for our lives. Hmm. Um, And so I think starting with self-awareness and and the way I like to describe self-awareness is really sitting with three stages of it. It's, it's past, present and future. It's, it's discovering, understanding, and then optimizing. Um, And so really it's as simple as sitting with a pen and paper and yourself for 15 minutes and saying, okay, in this past situation last week or last month, why did I do what I did, right? Here's what happened. Here's what transpired. Here's what I did and why and learn from it and say, okay, that's not what I want to do or that's, that is what I want to do. And I need to take responsibility for these actions or how it affects other people. And we start learning about ourselves and how we operate in different scenarios 
that understanding piece, the middle piece of present is saying in real time, I need to take ownership for this conversation with John, right? And if I, I showed up a minute late because I was a little bit behind in what I was doing and I need to recognize in real time, like, look, I'm sorry, I showed up a minute late. I, I didn't mean to, that, that was my fault. I take responsibility for that, right? Um, that's an example from today, right? <laughs> and so that's an understanding in the present moment. And then the the future is optimized saying, okay, you know, I've got this podcast with John coming up next week or tomorrow. Um, and many make sure that 15 minutes before I've got everything set up. So I'm not hustling in and showing up late a minute. And so I can be prepared to be the person that I want to be in that scenario that I can take ownership for showing up on time. Right. Um, and so that simple rubric helps us in growing in self-awareness in a way that we can um, begin to uh, understand what we need, what our task is to take ownership of and be responsible for and what isn't. And then we can start growing and doing a better job practically in that. I think ownership and taking ownership of my actions and even to like a cheesy degree, uh, taking ownership of like my dreams and desires has led me down a path of success that like I could never possibly have imagined. Um, I know it's super cheesy, but it is like an actual like physical and real transition that I've experienced by being able to like and, and I think writing things down is, is crucial, too, because I, I wrote down a bunch of like, you know, one year goals and two year goals and three year goals and six months goals and whatever. And, and just the process of putting those things down on paper and then like crossing one off is is just like an incredible thing that I, I never did before. It's not something I ever really put much thought into. But over the last you know year or so. I've gotten really diligent about journaling and, and writing things down. And I think it's had a, a, trema- a, a tremendous impact uh, on my life for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I created a, one of my, I created a couple online courses kind of based around this and the one on um, taking ownership or self-awareness, there's three primary tools that I think help us the most in that. And you just sit on, we just sit on one of them, right? Which is journaling and reflecting. I think that's primary tool. Number one, it's the easiest to do. Um, anyone can, is capable of doing that and it's probably the most natural place to start because it really involves that discovering piece looking back the next one that i always recommend is uh feedback feedback is really good for that present understanding of how i'm why i'm doing what i'm doing right now or even discovering in the past and so feedback from another human whether it's your spouse whether it's your teammate whether it's a coach uh, or someone else right is it's helping us see more objectively because we're seeing it from someone else's lens or their view or their perspective. Uh, and then the third one is meditation. Meditation helps us be more present so that we can be more prepared for the future, right? It helps us eliminate the noise and the distraction so that we can be fully here and now and see ourselves clear and then see what we need to do in the future clear. Uh, and so I think journaling, reflecting, feedback, and the meditation are three super accessible Uh, primary tools that help us grow the most in self-awareness you know i I do meditate now um i find it difficult i've got a loud mind i don't know whether it's the adhd or the sagittarius in me you know ask any number of ex-girlfriends they'd be happy to commentate um (laughs) but my my thought process is i wonder if like in my early 20s if i had like gotten into meditation if i would have like uncovered the things that I love doing now. Like I I can't necessarily say the podcast because podcasting wasn't really big back then. Um, but certainly photography, like it's, it's funny how when you have that quiet time to reflect on the things that are going on in your life, how kind of clear it is to see. And, uh, it's not something I ever did until recently. And it's made a a pretty significant impact on on not just my day, but like my life in general. Hmm. Yeah, and it's so simple, you know, it's just create, but it's simple in the sense that it, it's understandable, it's, it's um, anyone can do it or practice it. And I think the thing to remember for all of us with a thing like meditation is that it is a practice. It's not a destination to reach. It's not like I'm going to practice golf so that I can win the tournament. No, it's saying I'm going to practice meditation because it's a lifelong practice that benefits my life no end goal or destination, right? And that helps us not 
compete or beat ourselves up for not being quote unquote good at it or whatever it may be. Those are the most defeating things we can do with meditation. The whole point is just to be Mm -hmm. and create space to be. Uh, And so that's hopefully a more liberating idea for people to hear. Totally. It, it, it gets bogged down in being like a hippy dippy thing and less of a, like it actually makes a tremendous impact on your day. And, uh, it's something that I've been recommending to to people for quite some time um i mentioned earlier about goal setting like year in the future two years and i i I do that because i I felt like at a young age everything's like where are you going to be in five years like oh i'm going to graduate high school go to college get a job get married white pick fence whole nine yards do you see yourself forecasting things like that anymore do you see yourself putting out like you know into the future uh, I would say both. Again, like I answer that a lot. Like it's a yes and I think that's true in a lot of life. There's a lot of uh, paradigms that are kind of the beauties in the middle, you know, that gray, that tension of of using a bit of both. Um, so I agree. I think the younger we are, the more we're encouraged or reminded of the importance of setting those goals and having that trajectory, um, which is, I think, really helpful for shaping our direction, especially the younger we are. I don't think that importance goes away. But I think um, I think we grow in our understanding that we can't control or dictate outcomes. Um, we don't dictate any outcomes in life, really. Um, and so we have control and ownership over our actions, uh, but not the outcomes mm-hmm. most of the time of those actions. So what 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 helps me now is understanding that I need to have a north star. I need to have a point that I'm going towards. It's helping shape the trajectory and the direction. But I also need to have um, a rigid flexibility or an open handedness to it that says um, this will change like this 10 year plan will change and that's good. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to hold it open handed or this one year plan will change. And if I'm holding it too tightly, then I'm going to be too inflexible or rigid when the necessary adaptations come. Right. Because everything will change as life goes on. And and if we aren't open to it, if we're resistant to that, uh, it's going to hurt the outcome that we do want or we think we want. And the outcome we want or think we want is always different when we're there than we expected it to be, which helps remind us that it's not as important to dictate that outcome. It's just important to do the next step well on that journey and be more open to the new outcome that will present itself. Yeah. I, it's funny because I, I've learned a lot. I know, I know I'm fucking, sorry, broken record. I, I keep harboring the same trope that, you know, the, the growth in the last few years, two years, two years. It's funny how my openness to new people, new places, new things has just been so wonderful. And mm-hmm. it's, it's like... God damn, where was 25 year old John reading the wrong books and, you know, et cetera? It's because, like, so much of the experiences that I've had over the last couple of years have been so wonderful and so eye opening that I, I wish I could really tell this to other people that they, there's no person place or thing in your way except for yourself and your and your mind is like your single greatest thing that if you could just put it into the right context for what you want to do you could literally do whatever you want it's 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 fantastic yeah, <laughs> yeah and you know that that kind of ties into what we were talking about before of like you have transcended and included that right like mm-hmm. so you haven't removed yourself fully from who you were that's a part of who you are but you've transcended into a new part of you right and and that's what's helpful too with other people is we get to remind ourselves that, yeah, I have been in a similar place or I have thought a similar way. um, And through the experiences and the people and the opportunities that came my way, I was able to develop beyond that. I was was able to differentiate from my embeddedness and then reintegrate it back into my life in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Um, And other people will hopefully be able to do that too. And so how can I create a space uh, for them to experience that, which is always painful, right? It's always painful to be um, uh, differentiated from our embeddedness, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's always hurt. Out it on hurts. A limb. You know, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. it's it's a painful experience for everyone. But but how can I be a space for them to process that, experience that pain, and then grow beyond it? You know, and that's such a cool um, outlook to have. When we, it's hard to carry that honestly because sometimes we need other people to hold space for us. I'm like, I, I can't hold any space because I don't have any space. Yeah, you right. know? Yeah. Uh, and that kind of goes to the importance of meditation again. Of like, 
if we don't ha- if we don't create space for ourselves, we can never hold space for other people. I completely um, agree. I completely agree. And and I think all these things tie in together in that way. Yeah, it, it's it's a beautiful thing because even though you know I, I've often said like do as I say and maybe to some extent less as I do, I'm not like I don't have all the answers, right? But I I have created a space for myself to be successful in the things that I want to do. I've I've often been asked how'd you start a podcast? How'd you decide to be a photographer? Like how'd you do these things? And I was like I just did it right like a podcast mm-hmm. is like the entry to start a podcast is so incredibly minimal buy a microphone you probably have a laptop record something like to, <laughs> if you want to take pictures go within your means buy a camera start taking pictures start with your family start with outside like do whatever you can it's these are not like monumental life decisions they start very small so like all good things in life typically start from a small place and then grow because you realize you love it and you want to do more of it and that's kind of why i've keep doing this because i keep getting positive reverberative feedback to the things that i'm Mm -hmm. i'm doing and it's it's been fantastic for sure yeah um, yeah, I like to good. I like to spend the the last bit of every podcast doing kind of like a little Q and A, and you know some of these are going to be really short, quick answers, and some of them will be you know in depth and whatnot. Um, but you obviously read a lot, so my first question for you is, what's your favorite book? Uh, it doesn't have to be one. The hardest, <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest. That's the hardest question. I'll give you, I, you know, all of my answers to this question always come with recency bias. Um, so I usually uh, mention something I've read more recently. Uh, so the two that come to mind are one, um, Servant Leadership by Robert Greenleaf is a great um, all around, you know, that it's written probably in the 80s or 90s, so a bit older, um, but it's really a classic and, you know, it's a pretty boring title, right? Servant Leadership and everyone can assume that what that means, but He's a really, really humble, wise guy who's had a really successful career sharing um, a lot of the heart behind what that looks like in real time. And I just found it to be super uh, empowering and encouraging and helpful. Um, So definitely would recommend that. Uh, And then the other one to pair with it is called Antipes Coming Into COVID. (laughs) And I love his writing style. He's just uh, super witty, uh, super bright, and also... Um, super, um, how do I put it? Uh, rambunctious isn't the right word, but, but very provocative. He goes after people and he just <laughs> destroys people. It's great um, in his own way. And, and he's got great humor with it. But um, it's a really great book on this idea that because our world is so unpredictable and because we all think we're better at predicting it, we have the wrong focus. Instead of focusing on being resilient and durable, We need to focus on being anti-fragile, which means we benefit from chaos. We benefit. We don't just stay the same. We don't remain durable. We actually grow in the chaos because that is the world. And so that premise is super good uh, and helpful, especially for today's times. Oh, I like that. I'm definitely going to pick that one up for sure. Um, What's your favorite movie? Uh, another tough one. I, I'm a sucker for like just a cheap action thrill, you know? <laughs> um, so I really like the Batman series. Those are just so well done. Yeah. Um, I also really like, I, I mean, Saving Private Ryan such a classic. That's one that, you know, I, I love everything about it and I absolutely despise the one scene of that one guy being a coward, you know, and that oh. almost makes me dislike the entire movie itself. I talked about that with a friend this last week, actually. Um, but but it is such a really, um, I think it's, a, yeah. yeah, for us civilians, it's, it's one of the most helpful um, kind of visuals of just the tragedy of war and how traumatic it is Mm -hmm. um so that one really impacted me yeah i love that movie and it's cinematically beautiful as well um a little bit heavier do you believe in an afterlife yeah that's a great question so i'm a my i'm a man of faith and i'm a christian and so i believe in the bible and god and jesus um and i also think it's always different than we expect or think it will be and so I do think there's something beyond this life. Uh, so you could say afterlife. You can say a, you can describe a lot of different ways. I am more open to being wrong than I ever have been in this <laughs> realm yeah. um, because I truly know that we don't know. Right? That's the point. So I, I do 100% believe there's something beyond this life. I believe that um, 
we go to be with God, and there's a lot of different definitions for that. Um, and you know, I believe in that Jesus was God, uh, and that he he died for us. And I think that whatever's beyond this life is better. Um, it's the fulfillment. It's the fullness. It's the wholeness of a part of what we experience here. Um, so that's my best. I think definition that's a good answer right now. I do you think that the. I think there's a, I'm going to say from my perspective, that there's a freeness in believing that there's something after to kind of try to live your best life. Do you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I think it is empowering, right? I think it, without that, it's almost defeating. It's almost, What's like, um, well, I might as well just go ham right now, you know, because there's nothing else. So I think it is sad. It's a little bit more of a sad experience if there isn't anything beyond this momentary existence. Yeah. What uh, what's something that you're incredibly proud of? You know, I think I am. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is I'm incredibly proud of, of my first book. Um, I, I wrote my first book coming out of professional golf. And the original idea was to be a gift um, to my investors and sponsors as a way to say thanks for what they'd given me. Um, it changed as I wrote it. It took about 18 months in the process. Um, it's called From Here to There, A Quarter Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. Um, and, you know, I really can say I did the absolute best I could do on that, you know. And and to be able to come away from something um, and say that I did the best I could, period, is a fulfilling thing. And I've gone back and referenced it or looked into it or even reread some of it here and there. And, and I'm still proud of it, you know. And to have something that I'm still proud of, you know, four, what was it, four, four to five years later. Um, I'm just really grateful for that. So That's awesome. What inspires you? You know, I think my faith is a big part of it, right? A lot of what I do stems from my faith, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined in filling myself with the spiritual practices, whether it's uh, reading from the Bible, whether it's praying and meditating, um, contemplation, uh, and reading from other gifted spiritual thinkers. Um, that is the thing that fills me with the most inspiration. I, I really do believe like we can't give if we haven't received. And so by receiving that unconditional love from God, that's the only way that I can give unconditional love to someone else, right? It's so hard for us to give unconditional love. Like almost all of our love we give is attached to something we want. It's conditional, right? I'm sorry. Um, and that's equally true in marriage. Like it's super humbling to see, man, a lot of this is conditional on this, you know? And it's like, dang it, well, I don't want that. But when I receive from God's love and I'm able to do that through those spiritual disciplines, Man, it's so crazy how much inspiration and free, unconditional love I'm able then to give. Um, and so that's, I think, the most inspiring thing for me. I like that. I uh, Very many, many moons ago, I wrote for uh, a website called Thought Catalog, and I wrote an article that unconditional love is unreasonable love. Now, if I could <laughs> possibly remember what it was about, it was probably something shitty, as most of my things <laughs> that I wrote many years ago. Um, but I do, I do, to some degree, agree that... Um, there is very seldom instances in, in real life where your love is anything but conditional, right? My love is very much conditioned on it being reciprocated by the person mm -hmm. that I love, um, which is which is funny. Um, yeah. What is the best piece of advice someone has ever given you? Mm, man, that's a really good question. Um, let me think. You know, I think the, I think the, the, um, there's, there's like three or four that are going through my head right now, but, but I think, um, the best advice that, that I guess, I don't know who's given me, but I've learned through others, um, in this stage of life is that we're all just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the most fundamental uh, reminders that I need and we all need um, is that no one has it all figured out and we're all just trying to figure it out. Hmm. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs>
What uh, for the last question is what's like one recommendation that you have for something that you've consumed lately? It could be a movie, a TV show, a book, a podcast, just something that you've recently consumed that you loved that really filled you up, made you happy, or was something that you enjoyed. Totally. Yeah. I'm, and funny enough, I actually, my, I have a newsletter I send out every month uh, called in Thane. Um, and it's all the things I'm consuming and all the things I'd recommend. So if people want monthly recommendations, sign up on my website there for that. It's um, but, but more recently, I think the thing that comes to mind is a podcast I've listened to. I do more of the interview podcast when I listen. Um, and this one's more of a produced one. And so it's fun to s- kind of experience a high production quality and a story that's captivating. And it's called uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, Mm -hmm. um, which is a church in the Seattle area. So it's kind of geared towards a Christian audience, but it's good for all people. Honestly, it's it's great to just to learn the it's really helpful to learn the effects of power um, and how power can be corrupted. And I think more than any power in the world, religious power is the most dangerous Mm -hmm. because it's invoking a spiritual authority beyond human capacity, right? So um, I think it's one of the most dangerous forms of power and they do a beautiful job of, in a fair way, trying to paint the picture of the rise and the fall of this church behind this great leader um, and what all went into it. So if you're interested about power and spirituality and Christianity and how it can sometimes go wrong, I think it's a great podcast to check out. Oh, I'm definitely going to check that out. I find that wildly interesting for sure. Yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, Dane, thank you so much for coming on today. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation a lot. And I uh, hopefully we look forward to doing it again. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I say a really cheesy line. Everyone who comes on my podcast is a member of my family. And I'm, I'm so happy to have you. I think you're just a, a great guy. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, John. Really enjoyed it. And likewise. All right. Take care.